Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the Piano Tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. Hello, everyone. Rush. Welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour. Just let everybody filter in here for a little bit before we officially get started. Wow, look at all these good. humans. Oh, let's make sure and everybody, I'm going to mute everyone. Uh, just a second. And David, you should be able to unmute yourself. And Paul, uh, Paul, we should be able to unmute you as well. Yeah, go ahead and try to unmute yourself. I have to make sure. Hi, uh, John Ross, wow. Hey, John. Hello, hello. Okay. Yes. All right, so we've got a good number of people have joined. And so what I'll do is I'll give a little bit of an introduction. And if you... Yeah, let's, uh, okay, great. All right, so welcome to Piano Tech Radio, everyone. This is being brought to you by Piano Technician's Masterclasses, an online educational resource that offers you cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. You can find out more at www.pianotechniciansmasterclass.com. And up front here, I'll just remind everybody, we're gonna be putting on a convention in March. It's very exciting, great guests, instructors for that convention, including our guest for today, Paul McNulty, who uh, basically reverse engineers and builds uh, period pianos and forte pianos. Um, and over this weekend on Sunday and Monday, we're actually running a special 20% discount. So. Um, there'll be a coupon code. Uh, I'm not sure what it is off the offhand, but you'll find it in your emails if you're on our list. And we'll try to give that before the end of the session. So make sure you catch that in the name of George Washington's birthday and Valentine's Day. Fun combination. And uh, so now I'll give an introduction to our guest today. Our guest today is Paul McNulty. He is a graduate of North Bennett Street School and has made 280 forte, forte pianos. His copies of Silberman, Stein, Walter, Hoffman, Fritz, and Graf feature in many recordings and are owned by prominent players and leading music institutions, such as Nikolaus Arnakor, Paul Badura Skoda, Malcolm Bilson, Ronald Brautingam, Warsaw Chopin Institute, Classic Stiftung Weimar, Paris Opera, and Klein. Deborn Festival, as well as Cornell, Oberlin, Stanford, Harvard, etc. Paul McNulty was first in modern times to build Playel, 1830, uh, Boisselot, 1846, Stryker, 1868, and Chopin's Warsaw Piano, 1826, Buchholz. Paul McNulty's current efforts are restoring old French pianos for the Warsaw Chopin Institute. Thank you, Paul, for giving me all those wonderful words to pronounce. <laughs> okay. <You're Joe>. welcome. <laughs> so, um, yeah, welcome here, Paul. Um, I know David wanted to speak a little bit about you up front, but did you want to say anything to our um, to our viewers here? Give yourself. I, you, you know, thanks for coming. Paul. And and if there's anything, I, uh, I I like the premise. You know that you're offering advice over the whatever it is, the internet, <clears throat> and uh, I'm quite happy to talk about wood and things breaking and stuff like that. I think awesome. that's part and parcel of our business, you know? Excellent. Very good. Um, David, I think you wanted to share a little story or something up front. Well, we'll go ahead yeah, and do I that. Just, and... I just, I just want to really, you know, let people know what we have here. Um, I'm a, a relative troglodyte, relatively ignorant when it comes to period, period piano on period, period music on period instruments. But I've gone to, I was telling Paul this earlier, about half a dozen 
period piano concerts in my life, somewhere between six and eight. And I've been completely unsatisfied every time because and, 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 until this last National Piano Technician Skilled Conference. And yeah. I realized, <laughs> well, let me just say, I'm ashamed to say that I've just perceived basically period pianos as pianos I don't like. They sound little and rinkety and kind of fragile and brittle and I just didn't like the sound. And then I went to this concert by, I think it was Malcolm Bilson played these pianos and it was like, what? This is beautiful. This is awesome. And I was sitting next to a, a piano technician that knew you, Paul. And he said, yeah, it's Paul McNulty. He's the best piano maker in the world for period pianos. And I said, he is, because I've heard period pianos from all over and I've hated them. These are fabulous. So just know that you're, you're, you're with the master that, at the, that is at the top of his food chain. And he's got a lot of wisdom and a lot of, a lot of areas for you. So let's have at him. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. So yeah, we're, we're, we're very appreciative to have you here. That's for, that's for sure. Um, I'll, I'll just maybe start the conversation off here. I'm very curious because you went to North Bennett Street School here in the yeah. United States. And I'm curious, were you already into period pianos before that? Did no, I was and into, then you got into uh, I was into playing lute by default, uh, having not succeeded in becoming a, uh, so to say, professional classical guitarist. <clears throat> and people who can't play virtuoso Spanish music play lute music on the guitar. So I got involved in Dowland and that whole early music scene in the 70s was compelling. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I was not so, I was receptive when Bill Garlick is speaking of harpsichords and forte pianos, as he was. So it happened that way. Can I interject a joke that I, I actually oh, heard? I heard from a, a famous filmmaker that I met on the subway in New York. He had a friend that was a lute player, and he told me this joke. He said uh, that lutes are notoriously hard to tune. I don't know if that's the case or not. But the joke says that uh, a lute player spends half of his time tuning his lute, in yeah, the yeah. other half of his time, playing an out of playing tune. Out of, playing out of tune. That's <laughs> yeah, an 18th yeah. century comment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. No. Yeah, yeah. It's a tireless joke. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, I'll, I'll remember who told me that joke. It was, it, was a, it was a great person to meet. Anyways, so how did you, when did you build your first piano? Like, like I a did. Period I piano. was, uh, uh, what happened? I'll keep it short. You know, I was working for the, somehow by default, you know, going through life backwards. I wound up working at the Zuckerman Harpsichord factory in Stonington, Connecticut. And one day the telephone rang in the office for David Way from a lawyer in Oslo, Norway, saying, I represent the State Academy in Oslo. They paid you three years ago in full for a forte piano. Where is it? And the next day I was made a piano builder uh, wow. and I made it and three months later it uh, can you back up just for a second wait how yes. did they why did they pay you for the guitar no they, they didn't pay me they paid David Way and Zuckerman oh, okay Incorporated. Got, it. Zuckerman. Zuckerman. got it yeah for a forte piano and where was it uh, so I was really the next day uh, and I worked for three months, 11 hours a day, and I made the thing. And it, it made it that this piano was then, of course, in Oslo. And when I later was uh, uh, between two chairs uh, with no work, I was, uh, <clears throat> I, I, 
agreed to to accompany John Gibbons, the harpsichordist and pianist, on a tour with the Franz Bruchen uh, Orchestra of the 18th century, on a tour of Europe with somebody's piano, not mine, <clears throat> tuning and driving. And at the first rehearsal, <clears throat> the piano which they had uh, just fell apart. You know, you pick it up and you move it and the leg falls off. And, uh, <clears throat> and it was with wire made by Remy Goog, who was fond of hand forging wire. Uh, and what happened in the first moment of the Mozart C minor concerto was that about 10 strings broke in the first rehearsal. And they asked, do, do I know of another piano? And I said, well, there's one I built and it's in Oslo. And they called this Professor Shetel Haugsand on a Saturday and he agreed. And on Sunday, the piano's in the box on the airplane. And with this, uh, at the next scheduled rehearsal, they play through the first movement of the Mozart C minor concerto. And Franz Bergen turned around and went, Mwah. and that was my moment. I got, that's the beginning of my career. The first yeah. cello player ordered a piano, et cetera. And I moved to Amsterdam. This is 1987. Yeah. Wow. So, so did you have yeah. help? Did you have help and mentorship no. and... Uh, on that first piano? Uh, I had worked for Robert Smith in Boston, uh, but I I was not, I was just like putting strings on a piano and stuff like that. Uh, I was not, so to say, gathering, I was not picking his brains. And, you know, it just... It, so it, how did you figure out how to build... No, yeah, I, how did you figure out how to build a piano, dude? Well, it's, it's uh, you know, one stick after another goes together eventually. And <laughs> you have to, but there are, you know, you're steaming the bent side and stuff like this and not getting it correct and cramming it into position. Uh, it, it was just not, uh, it wasn't easy. But it was not. It's not as challenging as making a violin, for example. No, nothing on that order. Did you have? Did you have books or any kind of documents to go by? Grab? No, I had a drawing from the uh, Germanisches National Museum, uh, made in 1979, of <clears throat> of a Walter five octave Walter, and it wasn't a wow. drawing. And the piano was okay. Uh, and it was somehow loud and, you know, you, it's still in use and it, it, it did extremely well. If you look up, uh, anyway, it's not important, but on YouTube, if you look up the uh, John Gibbons Mozart piano concertos, there, that, there was live recordings during that tour, 1986, it was. Uh, and, you know, it's still there on YouTube when you hear it. The piano does well, very well. Uh, wow. I, so uh, your whole, your entire career in forte piano building and period piano building was literally on the job training. Totally. Literally failing upwards in a spiral. Right? <laughs> no, yeah, true. You know, you, it, I'm, I'm not naturally uh, well regulated or skillful, you know, or, or I'm not much in command, you know, but it, but the, the bills have to get paid, so you grind away at it, and maybe you know. Yeah. <laughs> but it worked out. It worked out well. And, and uh, I have, uh, you know, I, I recall uh, in the 70s, I, when I first was setting up some kind of a workshop, restoring somebody's old modern piano, and I needed to, to route something, you know, with a router, and, and I called David Betts. And I had I was a graduate, and so he and he kind of graciously came and showed me how to use a router. You know, I was it was that uh, unexper inexperienced, you know, and uh, so. But it, you weren't a, you weren't a shop guy growing up or anything like that. No, I never nothing. No, I all I could do was ruin toasters and things like that. Uh, I never <laughs> opened anything that I could put back together successfully. So. Wow. I, I made a bad. I made a bad using a friend's workshop. 
I made a bed when I was 25 years old. And, you know, other than, really, I have no background. Funny. And when did you make that first pianoforte? When I was 32. How 30, old? 33. Yeah. Wow. Uh, wow. And, uh, no, it worked out. It's still, it's still holding together. So... Yeah. I want to I want to cut in here real quick just Please. to remind people in the audience that they're welcome to ask questions. Um, you can put them in the chat. Um, we haven't we have uh, sort of your a lot of your concert technicians or field technicians coming through Piano Tech Radio Hour, so the questions can maybe be a little bit more familiar. You know, I've done this on the in the field. How do I do it better? Questions like that, but. Um, I think as we open it up to questions for you, there'll be a lot to unveil. And, and I think maybe I'll just transition a little bit to, yes. um, do you ever get calls from you know, a university piano technician or, or something like this, or just somebody who's trying to approach working on one of these pianos? No. No. And, but wow. if you don't, do you ever encounter like common difficulties or questions people have well about what happens is that people take the keyboard out without knowing quite what they're doing and they break hammers uh, mm. and they glue them back together with whatever they have and everything is sideways and uh, what i would like to emphasize is that there is a way to get a keyboard out of a viennese piano with more confidence uh, if we can talk about that, or I will kind of show it, it can be done. Okay. Th those are the issues that people encounter are, uh, you know, a click in the mechanism, and then the capsule, it's called a capsule, which the fork which holds the hammer shank. It's a metal-to-metal -metal bearing, and it, it's, uh, you know, like a clock. It's very low friction, but it, if it's not quite right, then it might click if it's the tiniest bit loose. And if it's too tight, then it's too tight. There, you have to be attentive and every now and then do something. And that's where the problem arises, is that you don't know how to get the keyboard out. And I can just tell you, the way to get the keyboard out... You can show. I, I shall. But the way you uh, get the keyboard out is that you look at all the hammers and make sure they're down. And then you start whatever you're doing, and you don't wear a jacket which will touch the keys as you're bending over looking. You know, the, I have had professors take the, you know, experienced forte piano professors take the keyboard out of a graph, and eight hammers in the middle of the keyboard are snapped off because he had his jacket if sitting uh, on, uh, you know? So it, it you know, you, you, there are just, you have to be, uh, there are rules. You know, the, caution is only this is the only thing. Keep looking at what you're doing and move. You know, if you can, if you move with some you know, thought that uh, yes, I will move. I will pull it out half a millimeter and rest a little bit, and then pull it out another half a millimeter until I know what I'm doing, and eventually you get it out. Uh, I can do I, if you just. Look over here. I'll take this keyboard out. Sure. I mean, this is a graph keyboard. And uh, for example, this is the uh, key slip. And it's got a spring on it here. And, you know, in this, for this design, it slides over and flips out. And some of these things, I can show you another one if you wish. Please come over here. It's a, also a early romantic piano. This is an original. Uh, and this thing, you have to do, you see how I bend it? I'm bending it, and then it comes out in the treble corner. Wow. You know, it's brutal. Wow. It it's into the slot here, and to put it back in, it's not going to go in. It just won't go in. But I, if I bend the heck out of it, then it goes in. Hmm. So, so why no, I'm going to take the keyboard out of the graph. I've just taken the key slip out, and then I look down at the hammers, and I'm bending over, and I'm looking at the hammers, and I'm not wearing a coat. And 
What I then do, I have determined that all the hammers are down. And then I get my fingers in someplace where I can reach, and I start wiggling it, you know? I'm just wiggling it left and right until I have it in my hand. The butt, the heel of my hand is there. So it's not going to jump out. If you look closely, there are knobs, which are, you don't really see it, but there's a brass knob or a gold knob. I can see it a little bit, yeah. Yeah, well, but the thing is, you, it's not there to, you don't use it to get the keyboard in or out. Could you just go just a little bit more and lower, please? Yeah, that's it. So you can see that my, if I want to get it, see, I have now gotten it down. I'm going to do that again, where you, you know, you wiggle it. And you wiggle it, and you and you have to wiggle it because you you want to help the hammer check rail uh, fold down out of the way. I'll show you what that means. Anyway, so I got it this far, and the rule is that I take another look once it's down, uh, that all the hammers are out, and then I can slide it, and I pull it out, and you see this is, uh, if you see what I'm doing here, that's the hammer check rail. And it's sprung so that it can it can fold out of the way, uh, so that it, it the, the action can slide up the risers at the at the rear. It doesn't go all the way to the rear and then up. It goes up at a certain point at an angular way, and then this thing has to has to sneak out of the way. Well, it's on a spring, uh, and it, it has it has also to get out of the way when the action is removed. That's why I'm. I'll show you again. When I get it in there and I want to get it out, I wiggle it. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, to help the thing go down. And if you've got an antique, maybe you have to reach inside with a finger, you know, and push it down, help it get out of the way. But you are, at every moment, capable of stopping and taking a breath and taking a look at what you're doing again. You know, and just take your time. Uh, it, it's a... Uh, it, it has to be done, you know, with some, you can't be totally stressed and, and do this comfortably. Anyways, like so when, when you return the action. Reach under, you look at this. You, I get up on, you know, I get it up and I got my hands on my knees, so I'm not trying anything strange. I, I don't uh, that's, that's on the return, right? You have to bring it up. That's on the return. I, here, I'm going to look again. I just wiggle it, get it down. And, but how do you get it back in? Well, I put my hands on my legs. I support them, and I use my thumbs. And I can literally, with my feet, lift my, lift my leg and my hand and my thumbs and you know, push the thing. It goes in and up. and Right. And, and you feel that. That's, 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 but you feel but that. You, you, have you, to you, don't, uh, you don't sort of grab it with main force. And try to wrench it around, you don't. You, then you lose feeling, is what I can say. And then okay. this is in. And I'll show you what a Valter does. I have a bunch of paper stuffed in the keyboard here to adjust the unicorda. Get that out of the way. All right. Now there's a Valter here, uh, and this thing is. It has a nail which holds the keyboard in, right? There's a pin, uh, which is in the, in the, you know, the tuning pin array. There's a pin which fits into the keyboard. And it locks the keyboard because, you know, it can, it can just look the way, again, I'm going to say, I'm going to look straight down, I see all the hammers. And then I, I have my hands in this orientation like that. And I'm going to grab the knob and I'm going to put the piano into, into my hand. At every moment I can stop, I can move out millimeter by millimeter and then down, 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 down. And then I look again and it comes out. Uh, and it, the Viennese thing where you have an angled, uh, angled blocks at the rear which, you know, slide the keyboard up. And that requires this to sneak out of the way when it goes in. Got a so question from the chat here. What happens if that spring is broken? Does that happen? The spring, spring is broken. Spoke? It is a bicycle spoke, which you bang on with a hammer. It's made that way. I'll show you. 
This is a, uh, oh, somebody made, you guys have, okay. In, in my latter days, people are using better material, but it's a long spring. And if you get a bicycle spoke from your neighbor's bicycle or, or the shop and you bang on it with a hammer, you can make a spring of your choice, right? Mm. Eventually it doesn't, it can't be terribly strong, uh, but it has this, you see that it has a, a range of movement, right? Right. And it's, it's on, if I am telling you about it, it's on a pin, it pivots on one pin on the left, right uh, here, yes? And if, for example, uh, the hammer check somebody's piano and all the hammers are checking in the wrong, they're checking too low, for example, then you can, on a single hammer rail, you can bend the pin forward like this, and they will all the uh, the hammers will check higher or the reverse. You can adjust it with on um, with this nail here, this pin. I hope this is clear to you. But there's a nail here. You know? Yeah. And you tilt it. You're saying uh, this thing. There, it, this there's a hole here, and that sits on that nail. Right, <clears throat> and it's it's there for your use for adjustment. It also it it you can incline it to the left, and then you're helping the rail. You want the hammer check rail to be in a some orientation, not too low, not too high, and the, the orientation of this nail on the left is helping the spring do what it has to do. As you, it goes together, but the the thing is once you. What we are speaking of in particular is getting the keyboard in and out. It's worth practicing. Um, and once again, if I say I don't want to try to lift it from an awkward position, so I have my legs here, my knees, and I have my hands here, and, I can, and I'm moving my feet, and by one means or another, the keyboard's going up because my fingers are there, and my fingers are on my knees, my hands are on my knees, right? I go up and wait a minute and wiggle, 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 and you find it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but I can see how people can totally screw that up because they're, well, they're coming it, to it, it thinking it's a piano, like it's your it, modern it doesn't, day piano. It doesn't yeah. quite go that way. It doesn't right. just come straight out. And you can't blame the piano for having this feature. There are technicians who blame the piano. Yeah, in that case, after they break something. That's Which bizarre. That form, as we say, you know? It sounds so, like a human thing to do. <laughs> it's a human thing to do. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut in here real quick. I'll just mention to the people that are watching on Facebook and YouTube, we're going to sign mm -hmm. off in a minute on Facebook, YouTube. So th there should be a link in the chat there that you can uh, come and join us on, on Zoom. So I just wanted to warn people that that's about to happen. Um, I do have some questions here in the chat as well. Yes. Um, let's see here. So David Skolnick from New York said, uh, Paul, did you at any point use old soundboard wood? Katzman in Amsterdam did at some point. Does that question make sense to you? Uh, no, but I have stuff in the, in the garden that's been there for 15 years. I don't see that, you know, there, there are harpsichord builders who made Rahamont instruments using 100-year-old Rooker's harpsichords. But that's because they were famous, not because they were, so to say, the wood was old and therefore more valuable. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I, I think it's, there's, there's something to say about, um, the polymerization of the resins in spruce, uh, which contribute to the tone. But if you, people also use fir, F-I-R wood, which doesn't have these resins and is all rather automatically sounding old, if you know what I mean. A warmer tone, it, it has to do, spruce has this requirement that, that the resins need to polymerize over time. That's, just, that's all I know. Do you, and do you think the polymerization changes the tone significantly? 
I, you know, I know that a piano of mine from 15 years ago has a, a tone I can't approach with a new instrument. It's like interesting. That. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, you know, it, 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 it's more, I would say there is more happening with string mature. The maturation of a string is probably more important to the tone. Speak about that. Well, I'll also, you also know, interrupt they, you one more time. If you need to sit down, we can give you a minute to sit down. I know you've changed who, your positioning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. yeah. Make no, sure I'm, just, I'm just in, uh, I'm in. Uh, okay. Whatever's comfortable. I just wanted to make sure. It's all right. No, Viviana needs to put this thing. She's holding this thing. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she doesn't need to be a. So let's put this all back together. Cameraman. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, of course, of course. Uh, but the no, the strings, uh, there is something in iron wire, uh, you know, the, the, the impurities in well made iron wire, for example, from Vogel in Germany, uh, V O G E L, and he makes harpsichord parts. And he makes a very good wire, which he calls Westfalisches Eisen, and it's it's ninety nine something percent pure iron. But the thing about totally pure iron is that it's like taffy; it will stretch forever. Uh, but the thing that that makes a, a, a an iron string useful is that it has impurities, which stop the sliding of the as I understand it, to stop the sliding of the iron molecules past each other like taffy. So there are some impurities, uh, you know, in the this phosphorus, so I don't know what it is, uh, that contribute. And ha as tone develops, there is something called um, cold creep, which eventually stops in a string. And I think it's at this point, after the first year, that the, the string is, is more uh, susceptible of singing, you know? Uh, Let me get to a couple other... My, my wife is saying exactly right. If you, the piano is played in a nice way, it will have a voice, you know? She knows uh, how to really play them in a very not, nice way. As a builder, I cannot say to a client, what do you mean the piano doesn't sound good? You better learn how to play. And I know people who have heard this kind of comment from builders. And you know. It, it probably <laughs> appears to work from that person's side of the equation, but they never <laughs> really understand the opposite side. Uh, I have a comment here, let's see, from Johan Krebs. He says, uh, this is a fascinating subject. I'm reading, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's been looking after a, a chance copy over the years and the right side has curled up, lifting the strings off the head bridge. How would you approach this common problem? Make a higher head bridge? you have any thoughts on that? Well, what I suspect is that the, the cheek, I, I suppose he means the cheek is lifting, you know? Uh, and if it's gone this far... Uh, he needs to take the soundboard out and mechanically change the shape of the frame and reinforce it because it was not designed to be so susceptible that you would lose all the down bearing. Uh, it's a defective thing. <clears throat> and if you want to get any, you can't get anywhere without deep invasive surgery. Soundboard out bend the frame over a period of weeks using, you know, blocks of wood and car jacks and things like this. And then, <clears throat> then get brutal with, you know, metal corners inlaid into the cheek framework uh, because the joinery was no good if it went this far. Uh, but nobody's going to pay for this. So my, Ultimate answer is walk away from it. It's not yours. Yeah. Um, what I, I was curious, 
it, I mean, it sounds clear to me that you're using all sorts of um, modern tools and improvising things to create these, right? You could use a spoke from a bicycle and you've got a router going. And, but I'm I was curious, in Amsterdam and there were bicycles everywhere. Everywhere, why not? <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm just curious, like, have you ever thought of or tried to, or it doesn't even make sense to like try to build a piano making it with only the tools that were available when it was made? Or do you somehow sometimes- only by, only, only by commission. <laughs> asked me to do that. Someone has asked you to do that, or no? No one. one. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. I I I understand about you know I use animal glue more or less exclusively, and uh, and I do that for a number of reasons. And one is it's terribly convenient once you get used to it, uh, and the other is that it's just superior, and it has a transfer of sound which is unequaled. You know what I mean across the barrier from bridge to soundboard and all that stuff. And uh, so in the, in, in the way of, uh, you know, hammer veneering, well, you know, hammer veneering relies upon modern thin veneer, right? Whereas sawn veneer is too strong to be coaxed into adhering by using a veneer hammer. This is all 19th century stuff. I'm not sure what a veneer hammer is. Sorry, my ignorance. A veneer it? hammer is where you, you know, you lay the veneer on the piece, on the substrate, and you have a, a, a it's simply a, a, a smooth bearing surface, like this wide, a piece of brass inlaid into a piece of wood, and then you've got a handle, and you're working the glue out from the center to the edges all around. And the adherence of the glue is stronger than the tendency of the wood to lift away. But this works only with the thin modern split veneers, you know, not the sawn veneers of antiquity. Okay. So th that's a technique which I used on my first piano, but that was with modern veneer and, you know, good. Glad I didn't have any presses. If you have a press and clamps and all the rest, then, you know, you're better off. Uh, but if you're forced to use hammer veneering, well, you can, and you just have to have water everywhere and steam all over the place, and you'll get there. Uh, as for other processes, you know, the uh, hand sawing is, is uh, I am just not capable of doing much with a, with a hand saw. You know, it just wa it just wanders, and I'm not I'm not ill. I'm not badly skilled. It's just they want. I don't know. Somebody else can do it, but uh, it there there is there is little to what I what I want to say. There is little to to commend to myself about uh, using uh, ancient processes. Right. Yeah. It sounds like in you, some you sense you have to get. Pardon me? Well, I was going to say, in some sense, it's, uh, it, it seems to me like the way that you're approaching it, the original makers of these pianos, if they had the tools that you have at your disposal, they would have used them probably, oh. right? They would be like, I would have, you know, they'd probably see these tools that you have and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. I, of course, I'll use this. I'll use this. It's that they made it in a way that they could do their best. And in some sense, you have kind of a, a really awesome opportunity to kind of do what they intended to do um, with with modern tools yeah well it you know the the end result is is uh, uh, it, the useful criterion but the thing is uh, that also people uh, woodworking was a was developed in children in apprenticeships uh, and the, the level of productivity is unequaled in modern times. There was no electricity. They didn't have coffee in the morning. They drank, you know, weak beer in the morning. If they didn't want to get sick because they couldn't drink water because it was too, too, uh, too dirty. You know what I mean? That's what weak beer, what do you call it? Uh, there's a word for it. The kind of weak beer which people drink. Right. 
And anyway, but I wanted to say that the that the there were you know you didn't work at night because you don't pay for the candles, and you didn't work on Sunday because everybody was religious, and so it 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 meant that that people were astonishingly skillful in woodwork, like Europe wide. There were there was a strategic necessity uh, that people were making warships in record time. There was a ship which was donated by Louis the 16th to the American Revolution, a frigate, you know, 36 guns. And it took them three months to make the ship. And then in, in, for the bicentennial, American bicentennial, the French government said, well, let's make another one. And it took them 19 years to make it. <laughs> you know? so we are not the same species in respect to woodwork. So I'm, I, Having made my first woodworking project at age 25, I do not qualify to enter the lists of those people who made these things, except by virtue of getting, I've got all these machines, you know? So I, I also, of necessity, in my first two years in Amsterdam, I made seven pianos working entirely alone. And that paid the bills. <clears throat> but Anton Walter, in his first 10 years in Vienna, uh, with 10 workers in a large workshop, made 385 pianos. So he made 0.85 pianos per worker per year. And I made 3.5 per year myself working alone. But that was brutal. And I got away with it. But, uh, it, it, I, I, I do not now and never would qualify to to replicate in to the degree of finesse. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I just, I mean, I'm looking at the striker, and it's a very good. Look at the graph. Look at the graph. All right, look at. I mean, I make nice instruments, and there's a lot. You know, there's freehand. That, that's all freehand routing on the inlays of in the Boisselo, You know, you see that. Oh. Oh. Yeah, Somebody... you know, freehand routing on the corners, and I'll move this camera. Uh, the thing is that the most important thing, Paul. Yeah, that's me, you see that stuff. Good lord. Yeah, I can't make this work. But anyway, that yes, sir. Uh, what I'm saying is the most important thing to me is that you make pianos that sing. And sound great, sound better than the pianos that I've heard that are quote like them unquote. Yeah, I think well, there, there there's uh, there are many ways to make something that resembles a piano, uh, but but there there are uh, concepts of downbearing and the uh, humidity gradient when you're gluing on the ribs. And there's evidence. You know, there's Mozart's letter to his dad about Johann Andreas Stein putting his soundboards out in the sun and the rain and the snow until they crack, and then he fixes them, and then they're nice. And I'm sure he was six weeks in Augsburg when he was a teenager visiting this builder, uh, and he went nuts. He just loved the guy's pianos, 1777. And... I'm sure this is workshop propaganda. Yes, the soundboard was cracked and repaired, but it was because, and I typically have this experience, that after the bridge is glued on the soundboard, that it is dried to a fairly well, and the ribs are glued on in a super dry state. And you dry it to the extent that the soundboard cracks, and you don't care because you've got the humidity gradient the soundboard trying to swell up again in normal circumstances, the ambient humidity, it swells up against the ribs and creates a crown. Right. And Stein as well has very robust ribs for the for a soundboard which totally lacks what's called a cutoff bar. Maybe there is such a yeah. thing. Yeah. It totally lacks a cutoff bar. So there's a broad expanse of soundboard with no uh, longitudinal rib. To hold the thing, just, wow. yeah. But but he has, flap, he has twenty millimeter. Deep, he has he has an array of the ribs which are 
in the area where, say, a harpsichord rose is and where the cutoff bar is, he has substantial ribs, which will defeat any effort of the soundboard to rise up into the strings, you know? But there is, of necessity, a crown. And there is in, for example, like, Walter, Anton Walter, had an original Walter open in my workshop, and there is an angled, uh, the, the, shall we say, the belly rail, you know? The belly rail is angled up, pointing toward, you know what I'm saying, pointing uh, in, in keeping with the bubble shape of the soundboard, as it were, right? Uh, I see what you mean. You know, and the, and the cutoff bar in a Walter is carved in a radius. Its glue surface is carved in a radius. The crown is was is not on the soundboard size. Not a modern concept. Pardon me. Uh, on the soundboard side of the rib, it's carved. It's a radius. On the glue surface of the of the cutoff yeah. bar, the main yeah. rib. It's you know it's this yeah. thick and it's that wide and it's quite yeah. long and, yeah. and it's carved yeah. on top. It's flat underneath. It's not a bent piece of wood. On its under surface, it's flat, but on top it's. Carved. Ratio. Also, Radius. also Conrad Graf. You know? Yeah. Uh, so it's like that. Somebody's asking, where do you find pianos like this? Well, call me up. You know? All right. Yeah. Do people act as distributors for you or some sort of intermediate? Or do people just go straight to you? No, it has not developed. That, that, that side of things has not developed. Maybe Viviana knows. No, we are working like artisans uh, and uh, like we don't have, uh, it's not commercial making, uh, it's hand making. And probably you professionals, you know that modern pianos, uh, if they sold via distributor, they have big markup, like from 30 to 50 percent. So uh, it was developed long time ago and of course for factory products. Uh, for clothes, shoes, and etc. It's normal that uh, things uh, which shop gets for ten dollars, they sold at twenty. Uh, but for us, uh, we are making by order, and of course, some models are very popular. So people already seen somewhere Walter, and they come. Oh, we want exactly like this, and then uh, how we can be sure that it will be like this, and we have policy that if people would n not like their piano, just simply don't like. We return all money. Never yet happened, but people very happy to hear it because they sure, and I am sure that all owners really want their pianos. Uh, so dealers, unfortunately, we cannot raise our prices because it's even in small piano, it's more than 1,000 hours of hand work only in our workshop. A Walter piano, like yeah. if you see my finger, I'm pointing, that thing is 1,200 hours. Only in our workshop. And that wow. is, I don't know, 800 hours of Stein. <clears throat> and the Graf is, uh, I don't know how many hours. Graf is uh, 2,000 2, hours in the, this piano. Somebody like the, the poly, the, this is shellac finish, right? That's a 15 year old piano. And it, and you know, it's sawn veneer and it's a shellac finish and it looks pretty nice. Right, and this is uh, 6,000 hours. This is 6,000 hours, not counting my work, this Boisselot piano. Right. Uh, 1846, it has 30,000 kilos tension. So to say business, to talk business, I would say that we would be possibly able to give some commission, but really not what modern shop has. Uh, but no, not, you can't do it that way. Yeah, when people come to us, way. they just order directly, and uh, that's how it works. You need uh, to have... Yeah, we, 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 we can talk about this later, but <laughs> there's a vast, no, really, there's a vast market in universities in Canada and the United States that would love to hear about your piano. Well, the argument, you know, the argument is that th that it is a, first of all, it's a valid instrument, which is, you know, that's the first issue, which you immediately brought up, David. Uh, it's a valid instrument, and it is. It, people were not suffering 
for decades and decades, writing the most prolific and the most, uh, I don't know what, groundbreaking music for keyboard when, you know, Beethoven basically invented pianism as a child. When he took two years off when he was in 1780s, he stopped performing and stayed home practicing and invented pianism. Mozart was a harpsichordist. I mean, give, he was a wonderful pianist. But of course, the, what we know for pianism comes from Beethoven. It was, it was just invented at the moment that the piano itself was rather being invented. And it, it, when something is invented in the first issue of, of something, the first idea as is represented can be the most beautiful and the most striking. And Beethoven in his early period in 1800 was writing the most striking and beautiful music anyway. But, but the, the point is they were not working at a deficit. The instrument was integral with the, the texture of the music being written. Anyway, it's like that. No, that's, that was a huge revelation for me. There, there had been this thing lurking in the back of my head that all these incredible, timeless yeah. com- writers and players of insane music yeah. had had to listen to shit sounds while they made their timeless, their timeless, you know, music. And listening to pianos that were made in the absolute pocket of that time, yeah. that singing in their own way, that sustained, that spoke to me, that had power in mm-hmm. their own way. It was amazing to me. It was revelatory to me. Nice to hear. Yeah. I mean, and yeah. I think I think what's uh, what's also really wonderful about what you're doing is they you you not only have the furniture like some people can make furniture but they can't make it sound good and um i think it's really great that whatever is you have in your soul is has both pieces you know and and you're really well the furniture part is a private satisfaction uh that nobody ever talks you know piano buyers do not talk about the furniture when they come to play them it's only how the thing sounds and plays it's it's it Mm-hmm. Furniture is my private satisfaction. <laughs> yeah, for us musicians, it's different. Uh, if I would be singer, I w- I wish I would have voice of Maria Callas. So if I get good, yeah. voice, I have career, and people will enjoy listening to me. And this was my consideration when I I was freelancing musician, and I was looking for fortepiano. And for me, it was terrifying to get not very good instrument so that people will walk away from my concert like David. So I wanted to get instrument which people will enjoy and professionals will enjoy. People will enjoy just normal listeners, not educated. And I found it here and now I want to share it so that also for my uh, own interest, I like to come to America and to have concert tour where in each city I will have good instrument. I don't want to come where I don't have instrument to play. I don't want to sound better than people leaving my concert. So it's very important for me and uh, more and more young musicians interested and uh, and not very young, like recently we had accompanist of violinist Vengerov, and he just was glued to the graph, absolutely. But problem is uh, Mulova also, violinist, looking in England to find normal graph. And of course, nobody wants to make recording or play on bad instruments. Like, who normal pianist will play on rotten old Stenway, out of shape, not holding pitch, with noises, not sensitive? Like, what... Uh, people don't realize, they uh, normal people, they say, oh, it's good sound or it's bad sound. But for us, it's also how sensitive it is. If I can have only maybe 100 gradation of sound, or I can make only or not is playing or it's not playing. Because in this case, I cannot make any sensitive phrases. I cannot shape music. It just 
um, I cannot express myself. It just I hate my result. That's so, right. Um, I will cut in here real quick. Uh, it's yes. been really awesome conversation. We hope to have you back. We're really excited to uh, put together your class in March as well. Um, we do usually wrap up right at the hour. So um, oh, I'll, no. I'll just tell you, uh, when we do wrap up, uh, let your computer run for a second. Uh, there'll be a re local recording that's going to be made. So don't forget to do that. Um, in the chat, we've put a link so that people can sign up for that convention. Um, if they register tomorrow or Monday, we're not telling you to wait. If you want to register today, great, get it over with. But on Sunday or Monday, you can use this uh, coupon code, which is all capitals, love GW20, and you can get 20% off. Uh, we put a feedback form in the chat. Uh, we're also doing an Amazon uh, gift card giveaway. If you follow us on Instagram and do some other stuff, there's a link to do that. By the way, folks, if you click the dot, 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 on the lower right hand corner of the chat, um, you can save the chat actually. So you can save all yeah. this information to your local computer if you want to. And before uh, we cut the session, I will also add a link so you can listen to Viviana playing Paul's pianos. There's a really wonderful video that she also has on her website where she's playing a bunch of different period pianos, different composers, yeah. and it's just a beautifully made video. So that link is in the chat as well if you want to check that out. Yeah. And um, may I say something uh, before I we leaving? Sure. That people also can come here. Hopefully, travel will be allowed again. And of course, the best uh, place to see all these pianos is in our workshop. Not only because there are many pianos, but because when you compare it one model to another, it's just like gourmet dinner. And <laughs> one you you see yeah. how how um, uh, different they are and just already one plus one it's not two it's like five <clears throat> no a schubert piano is not a mozart piano right and yeah. and it's we really, uh, would be happy to see people write us visit us and thank you for having oh, us thank you. that's thank a beautiful you. invitation thank yes. you Thank you, Paul. Thank you. David, Thank you. Both send me a letter. I, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to have met you. You know, I mean, we may have crossed paths in Tucson, but I'm really happy to see you. Send me a letter. Yeah. David. You got it. I'll do happy it. To hear, I'm happy to hear about your recovery and, you know. Mm. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, somebody else asked just one more time, David Skolnick said, how do you save the chat in the chat window? on the lower right hand corner of it, next to the little file icon, there's a dot, 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 an ellipsis. You click on it and the first option says save chat. And then you can save that and you can get all the links and whatever you need from that little little hack I just learned about on Zoom. So, um, and if you can Where figure that out. Where does it save it to? Uh, just uh, after you save it, um, if you go back to the dot, it'll ask you if you wanna show it in your file folders. So you could just click on that link, but um, I think it saves in your documents folder in a in a place called Zoom. You could search your computer for chat; it'll be saved as chat somewhere. So I know it's all complicated. <laughs> if, if if you need it, email me. Um, but uh, yeah, so we should probably wrap it up. We're at two two p.m. Yep. Um, again, thank you so so much, Paul. Um, we, we hadn't met you before. I, I got to speak with you on the phone a few times and by Zoom, but um, this was just a really excellent idea. I'm glad this has all come together and we look forward to working with you. Um, all right, well, I, I like this whole thing and thank you very much. And and the, the point is that when we meet in March, I don't know what day it is, but uh, mm -hmm. the 12th or 19th or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, then if there is a uh, prospect of, of technical description and I'll have samples and things to do, you know? Excellent, very good. We'll be sharing updated information as, as things progress. Any last words from anyone before I sign us off the, the Zoom? Thank you it's for a, it was a, arrangement. Yes, sure. it's yes. Especially wonderful... now we don't see many people and now we've seen so many people who are, how to say, our, uh, our team. Mm. So it was great. Thank you. Excellent. Family. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>
All right. So All right, guys. See you, soon, see you guys. in a few weeks. See yeah. you later. Thank yeah. you so much. Later. Catch you later. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week.